Good afternoon and welcome to another webinar of the America Europe Chair on Technology Innovation and International Regulation. My name is Sylvia and I will be moderating today's webinar. Before we begin, just a few words about the chair. The America Europe Chair on Technology Innovation and International Regulation is an interdisciplinary initiative of the America Europe Fund, which aims to bring together expertise at KO Leuven in order to track, examine, and compare regulatory developments relating to technology and innovation in America and in Europe. On top of that, the chair also promotes opportunities for cooperation and learning between policymakers, business communities, civil society actors, and knowledge institutes from both sides of the Atlantic. Today, we are fortunate to have Professor Peter Swire and Dr. Laura Drexler for an interesting discussion on the EU-US data privacy framework. This framework consists of the third attempt by the EU and the US to find a common agreement on EU-US data transfers. Professor Peter Swire is the Jay-Z Liang Chair in the Georgia Tech School of Cybersecurity and Privacy and Professor of Law and Ethics in the Georgia Tech Scheller College of Business. Peter was a member of President Obama's review group on intelligence and communications technology, and under President Clinton, he served as the chief counselor of privacy. Dr. Laura Drexler is a postdoctoral researcher at K. Leuven's Center for IT and IP Law, where she researches the regulation of the global flow of personal data from an EU perspective, as well as the role of individuals and their fundamental rights in light of technology develop technological developments involving personal data. Thank you very much to both of our speakers for joining us today. I will give the floor first to Peter, who will present the EU-US data privacy framework and its implications for the United States. Then I will give the floor to Laura, who will present the implications of this framework for the European Union. We will end the webinar with a discussion and a Q&A. Now I would like to thank our speakers and our audience for joining us today, and I give the floor to Peter. Thank you, Sylvia, very much. Um, my slides are coming up. Okay, and um, let's see. Okay, here we go. So uh, I've been asked to speak today on the EU-US data privacy framework. I'll give a brief background of myself and some background on the data privacy framework. Um, the core part of my discussion is about US constitutional law constraints that are relevant to the framework. And the United States and the European Union share a history of rule of law. Um, and many American and other non-EU lawyers have learned a great deal in the last number of years about EU fundamental rights law uh, in reading the Schrems and other cases. But with the data privacy framework, one point I'm going to make today is that there's reasons for European Union lawyers to learn more about U.S. constitutional constraints because we'd like to be able to comply with the fundamental law of both Europe and the United States. And the three constraints I'm going to talk about is standing to sue independence of the decision maker and issues around foreign affairs and national security. And my overall conclusion is that the new framework provides redress, uh, which is required under the Schrems II decision, and necessary and proportionate surveillance, which is the other thing required under the decision, and so complies with the uh, key precepts of EU fundamental rights law. My background, I was a student in Belgium at the L'Institut d'Etudes Européennes back, uh, back when I was a law student. Um, I already in 1998, when the directive came into effect, wrote a book uh, on these issues. It was called None of Your Business. It seemed like a good title at the time. It's been used by others since then without attribution, unfortunately. But uh, these topics are ones I've worked on for quite a long time. After I wrote the book, I went into the U.S. government as the chief counselor for privacy for the U.S. government and was the White House official when we negotiated the safe harbor in 2000. Coming out of government, I also worked on national security, foreign intelligence issues, such as an article in 2004 listed here. And after the Snowden uh, revelations began, President Obama had me on this five-person review group of what do we do to reform the NSA and US intelligence operations. I also testified in the Schrems II trial, a testimony of over 300 pages that you can read, giving details about US intelligence law. And my current a major activity besides being a professor is leading the cross-border data forum where we write on a lot of topics. We have European and US authors writing on issues of cross-border data issues. So to start, and this is familiar to this audience, but I often give it to the same context for, for US and others. Uh, I start by saying there's a legitimate structure for European data protection laws. Of course, the European Union and the member states have jurisdiction 
over economic activity within the EU. And governments pass many laws, minimum wage laws, environmental regulation laws, and governments pass data privacy laws for personal data collected from people in the EU. And so there's a normal reason why there's a, a regulatory possibility here under European law. Um, is that the, the, the second point though, is that data privacy laws, if they exist, should be enforceable. And so Europe has the structure that is only lawful to transfer personal data out of the EU if there's adequate protection. Otherwise, we could have strict laws within the EU, but all the sensitive data gets posted publicly after the transfer. So it's a logical part of enforcement to try to assure protection once it leaves the jurisdiction. And the Data Protection Directive and GDPR have well-known provisions for how to do this. There's standard contractual clauses, which we'll talk more about, the 2000 Safe Harbor Agreement, the 2016 Privacy Shield, EU-US. And the idea is you should protect data if it's transferred, and if there's not adequate protections, then it can't leave Europe. So a next issue is not just what commercial actors do, but what governments can do to access personal data after a transfer. So when we negotiated Safe Harbor back in 2000, it explicitly applied to commercial data, company shipping data. It was not a, a focus of discussion at all about intelligence agency or police collection of data. And so if the US company treated the data as if it was still in the EU, then it was okay to transfer to the US because it still had the protections. And the directive and GDPR have long had the standard contractual clauses, and they were created specifically to transfer data to where? To a receiving country that does not have adequate protection. And you get a promise from the data importer and the data exporter to follow the EU rules. And that's a way to have to assure adequate protection. And if the US at some future time, and I hope it will, passes a national privacy law, then that would be adequate potentially for commercial protections the way that uh, the UK, for instance, has GDPR rules and is adequate for commercial protections. Now in the Schrems cases, the, 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 the change from 2015 from the first Schrems case is that the company might do everything correctly, apply all the EU level safeguards to personal data, but there's no adequacy, the court of justice said, because the government might get the data, the US government might get a data. And on the pro side, the logic side is that it's logical to require protection of data privacy rights. Otherwise, these other governments can reduce the protections and the standard contract clauses or other instruments. And that's, that's the way the court of justice went. On the other hand, it is the EU judging the quality of US national security laws or Chinese national security laws or India. So there's an extraterritorial judgment about the quality of other governments' ways of addressing their national security. Another concern is there could be huge potential disruptions to data flow and commerce if the uh, European Union doesn't think another country is quite good enough, then it's hard for any company to come up with a way to continue business that has data flows. Um, so the data privacy framework came out of this history. Um, the US agreement in 2016 on privacy shield was struck down in 2020. And the court said there's two problems. The first one is redress. The EU person has to have redress because it's a fundamental right to ask about potentially unlawful surveillance. So France has the CNCTR, other countries have other independent uh, tribunals that conduct independent investigations and issue a binding order such as delete the data. And the point that the court of justice said is when personal data goes to the US, the EU individual has to retain this right of redress against unlawful surveillance. Now, how do you do that consists with national security? You're asking the National Security Agency of the US to give redress, which is a new thing in international relations. The other issue the court said is that only necessary and proportionate surveillance is permitted. And the US does surveillance uh, uh, under FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. That's when it's collected in the United States. And under something called Executive Order 12333, when the collection happens outside the United States. And the data privacy framework that's been negotiated has been to address this, and my own efforts have focused on the redress part as a tricky puzzle to solve. So here's a long and winding road to the redress proposal that we now have uh, the redress approach in the data privacy framework. So in July 2020, the court issued its SREMS 2 decision. Shortly after that, with Kenneth Propp, a former US State Department lawyer, we issued a proposal on how to do redress, but that had flaws in it. And that December, I testified for the US Senate on other ways to approach redress, trying to build out an answer. The problem was, or the intellectual challenge was, 
Um, we have courts in place for surveillance done within the United States, but this surveillance done outside of the United States under Executive Order 12333, that doesn't go to the existing court structure. And so how are we going to create a structure for all the signals intelligence the U.S. does? We then spent a year working with Theodore Christakis, a, a French law professor from Grenoble Alps with Ken Propp and myself, and we worked on dozens of issues trying to come up with some way that could work on redress. So in January a year ago in the European Law Blog, we had two articles. The first one looked at the question of what's established by law, what, what, whether a new US statute is required under European law, and the answer to that is no. And the second one is how the heck are we going to create an independent authority with effective remedy powers? That was our February article. So in October, um, there was uh, the executive order issued by President Biden, a new executive order, and very large details of the executive order tracked what we had proposed back in January and February. And at the time when in October, the three of us wrote this new article explaining many of the issues I'm discussing today. The European Commission issued its draft adequacy decision in December, uh, saying that this redress approach was adequate. And the European D Data Protection Board, which often is very skeptical of uh, US measures here, actually approved the redress approach, said we have to make sure it's done in practice well, but they approved the approach in their March uh, uh, opinion. So in one page, the, the um, redress pr procedure looks like this. The data subject in the EU makes a complaint to their local DPA. The complaint goes to the US, to the Civil Liberties and Privacy Officer and the Director of National Intelligence. The Director of National Intelligence sends orders to all the intelligence agencies. So there's an investigation done at that first stage. Then there's an appeal to this new Data Protection Review Court that was created under US law, US Department of Justice regulation. And the DPRC, this new court or tribunal, has independent authority to add to the investigation. It can make its independent judgment that's binding on all intelligence agencies, for instance, to correct or delete the records. And there's an independent advocate who also participates in front of the DPRC on behalf of the data subject. So once the decision is complete and any correction or violation, sorry, correction or deletion has been made, the individual who made the complaint is told, we have investigated and either there is no violation or the violation has been corrected. This is the same language that was used in the privacy shield without any major objection from anybody. It's the same thing that the French and German authorities do when they have uh, these kinds of independent reviews. And I will note that the new redress of procedure will apply for EU persons, but not to US persons. These are extra protections applying to European people as part of the agreement. So now I'm gonna to turn to this US constitutional constraints relevant to the framework. The first one is what we call standing, which is how you get to access to the US federal courts. And under Article 47 of the EU Charter, there's an individual right to an effective remedy before, quote, an independent and impartial tribunal. So one proposed solution naturally would be, let's send these claims to the US federal courts, to the federal judges. But the constraint is how we can meet the standing requirement in Article 3. And the solution is that we end up having independent adjudication, but we can't get it into Article III federal courts. And here's why. Article III of the US Constitution says federal courts are only allowed to hear cases or controversies. And what counts as a case or controversy is there has to be what's called an injury in fact. That's a required element under the Constitution before a federal judge can take action. So two years ago in the Ramirez case, there was a claim under a statute called the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And there was a right to sue under the statute for mistakes in credit history. And the facts were quite bad. The facts were that thousands of people were incorrectly listed as being on the terrorist watch list, which would make you unable to fly and have other consequences. And the court held the following. They held there's an injury in fact for those who had this error, error communicated to third parties. So some of the people had the wrong information communicated to others. But the court said, even though the statute provided a remedy, that constitutionally there was no injury in fact, there was no standing for those who had this terrorist watch list mistake, but there was never a communication to third parties. In the court's view, there wasn't an injury if the mistake was just sitting there in the file. So the summary of this point is there's a constitutional requirement to have standing to sue to get to federal courts. And even a violation of a statute passed by Congress is not enough to create injury in fact, unless the injury actually exists. 
And unfortunately, I haven't seen any proposal that fixes this so-called standing problem and enables redress claims to be filed in US court. Um, one proposal made by the American Civil Liberties Union has been individuals maybe could get standing if they take special steps to avoid government surveillance. However, that doesn't meet the Article 47 requirements because Article 47 requires every individual to have a remedy before the tribunal. Most people in the EU don't take all these steps to avoid surveillance. And so the ACLU proposal literally does not meet European legal requirements. So what did, what did we, what did the governments do in the data privacy framework? Create a new tribunal by actions of the president and the attorney general. And the redress claim this way is available to every individual as it has to be under European law. We just can't get to federal courts. So that's the first one. What are some more? So is a new statute needed? So many people have made the criticism of the framework from Europe that there needs to be a statute that provides for these protections for European persons in law. Now, Article 47, two of the charter and also the, the European Convention on Human Rights do require an independent and impartial tribunal and the key words are established by law. Now, if there's a statute, the tribunal is established by law, but can a tribunal be established by law without a new statute passed by the legislature? And drawing on Professor Christakis's very extensive experience as an EU legal expert, our article documents EU legal reasons for saying it doesn't have to be a statute, case law, regulations, other things can count as law. And there's two apparent constraints on the role of the statute. The first one is how do we create independence by statute? The second is there's constitutional limits on what Congress can do of Congress's competence over certain national security and foreign affairs issues. And you're familiar with that because of limited EU competence over national security issues. And the solution is that the tribunal is created by something called the Department of Justice regulation and the binding effect of the tribunal and other things are created by executive order. And these are legal instruments within the US meaning of law and within the EU meaning of law. So let's look at the independence of the tribunal. Um, this may seem strange, but there's limits on how Congress can create independent tribunals. So just two years ago in the Arthrex case, there was a statute that created independent judges for patent cases. They were independent of the patent office, they're independent of the Secretary of Commerce. The US Supreme Court said this statute done by Congress was unconstitutional because under the US separation of powers approach, the executive branch decision must have recourse to what's called a politically accountable official. And this is an example of what legal scholars have called the unified executive approach, one executive approach taken by this Supreme Court. I don't agree necessarily with the Supreme Court here, but it's our Supreme Court, our rule of law. So the puzzle then is how do we create an independent tribunal that also has recourse to a politically accountable official? And the answer in the data privacy framework is the officials, such as the president and the attorney general, voluntarily give up some of their discretion in a way that's legally binding. They have the power, they give up some of their power. And so the attorney general issues a regulation giving up his power and giving it to the data protection review court. The president issues the executive order yielding his power to the binding decision of the DPRC. Now, of course, they could take back their power, re repeal the executive order, the regulation. But at that point, the EU would have public notice of that and adequacy would no longer exist. So adequacy is conditional of having these rules in place. And there's Supreme Court precedent to support this. The one I'll focus on is the Accardi case. In this case, there was a similar Department of Justice regulation similarly issued by the Attorney General, and it gave powers to the Immigration Court for deportation decisions. The Attorney General then didn't like one of those deportation decisions. The Supreme Court said to the Attorney General, you lose. The regulations in effect, the decision of the court is final and independent, and the decision of the Immigration Court rules. And so this independence of the DPRC is based on established Supreme Court precedent in the United States. More briefly on the role of the president for foreign affairs and national security, EU law says that these international surveillance tools like the executive order 12333 has to be included in redress. So some people have said, well, Congress should go past the statute setting up how um, this international surveillance will happen. But there's an important US constitutional constraint the president has unique power and competence for foreign affairs, treaties and stuff, and for national security. 
And the solution is the president himself put rules here in the in the executive order to have redress even for this kind of surveillance. And whether the collect, so, so there's two places where the role of the president is somewhat different. Some of the surveillance is done in the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, the 702 surveillance. That's done within the United States and Congress plays an important role to draft statutes for in the United States. But the other collection is done outside of the United States as part of the president's national security foreign affairs area. There's a very long history of the presidential discretion here, and Congress has not previously stepped in to reduce that discretion. Well, could they if Congress wanted to? So there's a 2015 Supreme Court case where Congress tried to pass a statute on details of foreign affairs about the recognition of countries. And this statute was held unconstitutional again. The Supreme Court said, no, the president has that power. It's not the job of Congress to do it by statute. So in conclusion on this one, the constitutionality of redress is clear for these international actions under the executive order. But with this Supreme Court, if Congress tried to write a statute, there would be a lot of doubt about whether the statute is constitutional. So I have two concluding slides and then I'll be done. To date, EU courts have not found the constitution of a third state to violate requirements of EU law. So we have not seen the Court of Justice, for instance, saying something about the US Constitution or the Canadian Constitution is contrary to fundamental rights. As I've tried to explain today, there are serious US constitutional constraints on how to build a redress system. The data privacy framework provides redress, respecting the substance of all the fundamental rights uh, that the court has specified for redress. And to the extent the form of the legal institutions differs, then that becomes an issue of what counts as essential equivalence under EU law. If the US has built the best system it can to meet European fundamental rights laws and substantively protects those things, well, Europe say, no, the form is incorrect. Now, to date, there's literally no other published approach to redress that meets the requirements of both EU fundamental rights law and US constitutional law. So if this approach to redress is struck down in Schrems III, that really could be equivalent to saying the US would have to go and amend its constitution for there to be any lawful data flows with the, with the European Union. But we've seen there's been other adequacy decisions, South Korea and Japan and the United Kingdom. They have different legal frameworks than the European Union. They are rule of law democracies. And to date, transfers to these countries have been held lawful and considered lawful. And so when the US does what it can to meet the rights requirements and does meet the rights requirements substantively, my point would be that it should be upheld. Now, what about the other parts of the data privacy framework? Um, this is my last slide, so I'm gonna do it much more briefly. The Court of Justice said that there can only be necessary and proportionate surveillance. And the uh, Biden executive order from October issues a new order and directive to US intelligence agencies. The US intelligence agencies going forward may only conduct necessary and proportionate signals intelligence. In other words, the European standard has been adopted and the agencies are, are close to finalizing the new procedures to do this. This was a concession or a change to US law and practice the US was not willing to do during Privacy Shield in 2016. And so here for the first time, the US has agreed to the EU legal language and to the conceptual approach to surveillance of only necessary and proportionate surveillance. And the EU can look at these detailed procedures and practice going forward. So as my final conclusion for now, the DPF, the data privacy framework is a good faith and detailed effort to meet EU fundamental rights requirements consistent with the structure of US laws and institutions. And so I hope going forward, we can see this good faith and resolve any remaining difficulties. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for your very interesting presentation, Peter. Before I give the floor to Laura, I would just like to let our audience know that they can ask questions for our speakers using the Q&A tool at the bottom of the screen. We will go through these questions at the end of the webinar. Now, I would like to thank Laura for joining us today, and I would like to give the floor to you. Thank you. Uh, Sylvia, can you see the slides? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you so much also for Peter for giving this very interesting overview um, from the US perspective. I'm here today to present um, the EU viewpoint, which is, as you may guess, a slightly different, but um, let's get into it. 
Um, I want to focus specifically on, on three points. I also want to reflect a bit on how we've got where we are today, what happened before we got the draft uh, data privacy framework that we have now on the table. And then I want to look a bit at um, a overlooked part of the new data privacy framework, which are what I call the substantive principles, which are the principles that apply um, around the commercial um, aspects of data transfers and how they comply with the standard of the EU for data transfers. And then finally, I also will dive into the governmental access part of the new framework, discussing also the executive order that we have already heard from, from Peter. To um, start off, so how did we get to where we are today um, from the EU perspective? So as you may know, in 1995, the European Union adopted its data protection rules in the form of the Data Protection Directive. And then fairly quickly after, if you consider that most member states took a long time to transpose this international law, we had an agreement with the United States about um, data transfers, which was the uh, Safe Harbor Agreement. And actually, I see there is a mistake on the slide. It's from 2000, not from 2001. Um, this agreement was then uh, invalidated by the court in 2015, as Peter has also mentioned. We then had a new agreement, which also was invalidated by the Court of Justice in 2020, and now we are in front of the third agreement. I'm showing you this timeline, and I have circled red the two decisions of the Court of Justice, because um, you can see that the Court of Justice decisions were motivated by EU fundamental rights. So it invalidated these decisions because it found that the amount of protection it provided to individuals was not up to the standard that it thought the data protection rules um, required. To go more into details into that, I think it's worth looking at how the transfer rules of now the GDPR are being structured. And I think to understand these rules, it's very important to look at what is the objective of these rules. Um, and here we can look into Article 44 of the GDPR, which now sets a general principle for all transfers. And this general principle, and I've underlined this in the text, the aim here is to ensure that the level of protection of natural persons, so of individuals in the European Union, is not undermined. So the idea is that the data protection law in the EU provides a certain amount of protection to the fundamental rights and freedoms of individuals when their personal data are being processed. And this level of protection protection should be maintained as much um, as possible. Um, here, of course, we see um, Schrems, who is the reason why we better understand now what the code exactly means, but is not undermined um, to, to a transfer. And this is because, of course, he's the reason for the two cases um, concerning the US that we have in front of the Court of Justice. Um, the first one of these um, was of 215, is the Schrems 1 case. And here, I just want to highlight that the court has um, given us a very detailed explanation of what it means when it says we should make sure that the level of protection is not undermined. It linked this to the term of adequate level of protection, so transfers can only take place if there is an adequate level of protection, and it explained that this means that the third country needs to ensure a level of protection of fundamental rights and freedoms that is essentially equivalent to that guaranteed within the European Union. And the level in the European Union is judged um, looking at data protection law. Back then, it was the Data Protection Directive and the Charter. So it really um, put a fundamental rights standard linked to um, the transfer rules. Um, to go a bit more into detail into that, um, the court's reasoning is basically based on um, the assumption that if you transfer personal data outside of the European Union, you create interferences with EU fundamental rights. And some of the interferences in the first Trump's case were very severe for the court to the extent that they found a violation of essence of a fundamental right. For those of you who are not familiar with the concept of essence, the essence of a fundamental right, it's really it's, it's very core. Um, and while principally all fundamental rights of the chart in the EU can be um, restricted following the standard rules and conditions of Article 52.1, if it's a violation of essence, there is no justification possible. And then the Schrems 1 case, the court found two such violations of essence. First, one of the fundamental rights to private life, so privacy, which is guaranteed in Article 7 of the Charter. And another one, um, because there was no legal remedy to have access certification or erasure to personal data, which violated the essence of Article 47 of the Charter. Um, you don't see this on the slide, but the court also discussed an interference with the fundamental right to personal data protection, but here it did not see a violation of essence. 
So this was a very um, serious statement by the court because the court does not find violations of essence uh, very often. So this was, I think, the second time the court has resorted to this concept. In um, Schrems II, the, the court basically confirmed its initial assessment. So it said, if you transfer personal data, you interfere with European fundamental rights. And you have um, especially to consider the fundamental right to privacy, so private life of Article 7, and also the fundamental right to personal data protection of Article 8. Um, you also, um, for these two rights, um, in the Schrems II case, we didn't have a violation of essence this time. So the court uh, checked the conditions of Article 50 to 1, especially the condition of necessity and proportionality. And here it found that um, the way that the interferences happened to Article 7 and 8 via the US um, governmental access rules was not necessary and proportionate um, according to the charter. It did again confirm a violation of essence for the fundamental right of effective judicial protection of Article 47, because it said there was again no possibility to have access to personal data, rectify it or erase it for the individual. So now that we have um, this background in mind and we understand that for the Court of Justice, this is really a question of fundamental rights, let's look a bit at um, the US data privacy framework, but look at the substantive principles. So those principles that apply to the commercial side of data transfers. Um, before we go there, I think it would also be interesting to quickly go over how adequacy decisions work um, in the European Union, um, because it's uh, quite important, of course, to the data privacy framework discussions. Um, there is basically kind of three phases of any adequate decision. You have a preparatory phase where the commission, according to the law, is supposed to assess a third country, in this case the United States, and figure out if they have this level of essential equivalence that is required. Then there is the um, official adoption process, which starts with the publication of the draft adequate decision, um, which we already have. Then there is an opinion of the European Data Protection Board, which we also already received for the data privacy framework. There can be a resolution of the parliament. We had one um, for the framework as well, which was published beginning um, of May. Um, and then it's finally adopted in the comitology procedure. I'm showing you this slide to understand that according to how adequacy decisions are regulated in the GDPR, it's supposed to be a unilateral kind of decision of the commission where it assesses a third country and then decides if it's adequate or not. Of course, how it works in, in practice, and I think you can see this also from Peter's slide, is that it's a negotiation. And I think that's only logical because in the end, it's, it's a bit of an awkward task to assess a third country without asking a third country um, and to be involved. The problem with this is that it's in fact negotiations is that once we have a draft adequacy decision, it's very difficult for the European Commission to go back and change something because then um, it has negotiated all these things with um, the third country and it cannot really react very well to any um, criticisms that it now receives from the European Data Protection Board. And um, I have assessed all draft adequacy decisions and final adequacy decisions that came out um, since the GDPR. And I saw that there's hardly ever any substantive changes between the draft and the final version. Um, and I think this is really a consequence of the fact that um, it's based on negotiations, which was not foreseen actually in the law. And this makes it very difficult for the commission to react to any um, criticisms it receives. I think this process could be much improved if there was more transparency before there is an adequate adequacy decision. I think this could also help to um, counter the criticisms often justified that the European Commission does not understand well um, the legal system of a third country. If we are more transparent in this preparatory phase, I think we could um, be also more thorough in the assessment of adequacy. Going back to the substantive principles of the data privacy framework, as you might be aware, the data privacy framework is a self-certifying uh, regime. So organizations in the United States who want to use the framework have to apply to the Department of Commerce. They have to submit uh, a lot of documents for this. And then the Department of Commerce can conduct formal checks. So are all the documents there? Um, they do very little substantive checks. However, they now promise to try to do more on-spot checks on if the um, requirements are actually put into practice. If the certification is um, successful, there will be a, a list of organizations who are certified, which will be published by the Department of Commerce. And um, all organizations on that list have to annually recertify. 
Now going into what are these principles that now for the commercial transfers have to be insured, I put them all um, on the slide for you. I will not uh, go into detail of, of for them, um, just for you to see. And one thing I want to mention is that these principles are kind of unchanged since we have the safe harbor agreement. So um, it's since 2000 that we have these um, seven principles and they have not been amended in any way or form, even though we had um, all these discussions about data transfers. It is true the Court of Justice has also never really discussed this part of the, the framework. It only once said that self-certification is a means possible to achieve um, adequacy, but it never went into the details of the different principles, etc. Um, next to these seven core principles, there are also 16 supplemental principles. Also here, these are principles that were basically put in place with the privacy shield, and you can even trace those back to the safe harbor agreement where they were part of the Q and a sort of frequently asked question document where most of these things were discussed. So again, we have principles that date back basically to 2000 with very little changes. And we discussed this in detail, um, my colleagues and I, in a working paper that we have published um, last week. Um, what does it mean now for the concept of essential equivalence? Remember, it is about transfers are an interference to fundamental rights. And of course, this can also happen if companies use the personal data. I mean, this is the whole reason we have these data protection rules within the EU to also ensure fundamental rights when companies are using personal data. Um, some problems that have been also pointed out by the European Data Protection Board and before that the Article 29 Working Party is that this whole set of principles has very few limits on the collection of personal data. If you remember in the European Union, we have this lawfulness principle that all personal data needs to be collected based on one of the legal bases provided by the law. Something similar is very difficult to find in, in the principles. And that has um, this leads to questions of whether there is really um, essential equivalence in the amount of protection there. I'm coming to Data subject rights, um, here again, the rights that are included in the data privacy framework are not fully the same as we have, for example, under the GDPR. And also, um, and I think that's the more problematic aspects, those rights that are there, there's very broad possibilities for restrictions. For example, with the GDPR in the EU, we have kind of eliminated the possibility to restrict the data subject rights because it would be a disproportionate effort for the company to fulfill it. Disproportionate effort is now, however, very much a restriction possible under the data privacy framework. And then finally, um, I think there can also be some question marks of how legal remedies work in a commercial context. It is quite um, complicated. Uh, typically, you would have to go first to the organization, and then um, there's different options that they can guide you to. Um, the same system was already set up under the privacy shield. It has never really been used there. So the European Commission in its evaluation of the shield always mentions that there has been no case, which for them means um, it's all good. However, I think it might also really show that there are some practical hurdles for individuals to really benefit from any of these legal remedies, such as that they are very confusing, they're kind of inaccessible, maybe there's language barriers. I think this would be aspects that could be further looked into. To now finally go into the governmental access part and to add a bit to what Peter has already explained. The governmental access part is basically the innovation of the data privacy framework, because as I mentioned, the principles and the supplemental principles have not changed much. However, this governmental access part truly has changed a lot. And this is because of this executive order that um, Peter has already mentioned, which was adopted last year, October. Um, it has five sections, and um, for our purposes, we will focus on um, the signal intentions activity section, which lays down these requirements for necessity and proportionality, and of course, the redress mechanisms in section three. Um, to go to the proportionality and necessity requirements, um, what is remarkable, and I really do think that this is an improvement of the new framework, is that the language of necessity and proportionality is now taken into the executive order. However, and I think you can um, pose questions here, it is not quite clear if this is really then understood the same as we would understand this in the European Union. Um, for once, to remind you, in the European Union, necessity and proportionality relates to how far an interference with fundamental rights um, can be justified. This sort of language is um, not in the executive order, kind of, of course. Um, and also, um, one thing, and that's why I put this in yellow on the slide, is that necessity in a European context, and it comes to 
for especially bulk um, access to personal data would always have to be strict necessity. And strict necessity we understand typically as that there is no other means to achieve um, the legitimate objective in case. In this case, however, the text explicitly says that it does not have to be the sole means um, for, for it to be necessary. So I think here, um, based on the text alone, you can ask some questions on whether this is truly the same as we understand it in the EU. However, that all being said, I think in the end, it will really matter how this is um, applied in practice, how the data protection review court especially will look at these questions in practice for us to really understand whether necessity and proportionality can be um, similar to how we understand it in the EU and whether it is enough to justify this interference into EU fundamental rights. Another interesting thing, um, so for the signal activities, which um, is bulk collection, so when there's a lot of data collected without a specific target, um, there is a list of objectives that can justify this bulk collection. If you are a bit familiar with um, EU case law, then you know that in the EU, this, this discussion on when can we do bulk collection has been a long one, ongoing since the Digital Rights Island case in 2014. And the court has put um, very strict limits on this. And one limit it has put on this that was confirmed in 2020 in the Lac Patre du Net case and also in the Privacy International case, is that bulk collection can only ever happen for national security objective. Mm -hmm and also can only happen for a sort of a limited period of time, so with some sort of restriction. Um, for the first one, I've highlighted some parts in yellow on the slide. The law, I think, in introduces some objectives that I think you can argue about whether they are really strict national security objectives as understood by the European Court of Justice, especially the one on transnational criminal threats, which sounds to me a bit like serious crime is something that was really discussed by the court and it said serious crime would not be enough to justify bulk collection of personal data. So here again, I think there could be a bit of a conflict about what the um, Court of Justice requires and what was put in the text of the executive order. Um, this has been um, also previously discussed by Peter. So for the EU to benefit from the executive order, it has to be um, designated as a qualifying state, and there's three conditions uh, for that. So for once, the EU would also have to have appropriate safeguards for surveillance activities in, for the United States persons. Um, as a second condition, the transfer, it has to be opportunity for transfer for commercial purposes, and finally also has to advance the national interests for the United States. I think there's nothing uh, wrong with these conditions in, in general. However, it of course means that um, the executive order is kind of conditional on the adequacy decision, which is, it enables the commercial data flows. So if there's a problem with um, either of the two, both of them kind of might uh, fall. So there's this interdependency between the executive order and the adequacy decision. Um, and then finally, some words on the redress mechanisms. Um, I will be very brief here because I think Peter gave a very good overview of how this works. Um, just some words also on the data protection uh, review court. So this is supposed to really fix the problem of the Code of Justice for the interference with the essence of the fundamental right to effective judicial protection. Um, however, I do have some question marks here um, also. And this mainly relates to this. Um, I showed you this before. So in the Schrems cases, both one and two, the court found a violation of essence because there was no legal remedy to have access, rectification, or erasure to the data for the individual. Um, if you think about the Data Protection Review Court, um, and this was also mentioned by Peter, it always gives this answer. So it always gives this answer that the review either did not identify or um, there was a sort of remediation. Um, if you then think about what access is supposed to mean, which is really about transparency, about what happens to the data, understanding what happens to the data, then I am afraid that this kind of standard answer is gonna be very difficult for um, the access. And also there is no really any other way for individuals to really understand if the data has been at the end of the day processed at all by US uh, national security agencies. There is one possibility that eventually after a certain amount of time, information gets declassified and then the individual gets informed, but that would always be after everything has completed. So I, I really see a bit of an issue with the fact that this new system does not really enable individuals to have access to the information that they would require to actually decide of what they want to do um, on in a particular case. 
So uh, in the end of the day, I think that this issue with the legal remedy not really providing access to personal data could be actually what um, breaks the card house in this case. However, there's also other issues, as I mentioned before. I think the substantive um, part of the data privacy framework has also some issues. And it's true that the Court of Justice has never discussed these issues with the substantive part because they were always very focused on the governmental access part. However, I strongly believe that this does not mean that the Court of Justice approved um, this area. I think it just means that they were discussing um, something else in the particular case. Um, there's some further writing I did on essential equivalence, on what is a data transfer, but also particularly on the data privacy framework, which is this working paper that I mentioned. Um, so if you want to read up more, please, please do. And um, I'm now looking very much forward to discussion um, with the audience and also with Peter on the new framework. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura, Thank you. so much for this interesting presentation. Before we go into the Q&A part of our webinar, I would like to ask first our speakers for their immediate reactions uh, to the presentations. Peter, perhaps starting with you, what are your initial comments, sure. thoughts uh, on the points made by Laura? Right. Well, I, I, uh, so on, I think one of the most important critiques that she made is the lack of access. Now, the same paragraph said there has to be rectification and erasure. And the data privacy framework has a mechanism for rectification and erasure and binding decisions by the data protection review court to to order that so those are things that are directly responsive to what the court of justice has said i think when you talk about access to criminal records like am i under investigation you know by the local police or national security records which is am i on a terrorist list that the you know the government's looking at there's a long history of limited access because there's compelling public safety and national security reasons not to tip off the criminals that they're going to be arrested tomorrow and things of that sort. So, so there needs to be some modification of access when applied to these settings that are different in some way from um, what access means for getting your medical records from your doctor. And I, I think uh, to simply say there's not access um, would require a much longer conversation about what the appropriate legal structures are and what compensating safeguards there are for access. So I, in terms of the neither confirm nor deny, always giving the same answer, that's that's a topic we hope to write about later this year. It, it is the same answer given in France. It is the same answer given in Germany. It is the same answer given in the United Kingdom. Maybe all of those regimes are horribly awful and really not meeting required standards. But it is notable that this same answer was given in Privacy Shield and not criticized by the EDPB, not criticized by any of the uh, by the Court of Justice. And so we're giving the same answer here that hasn't changed and it's the standard answer in Europe. So if that's the reason why transfers to Europe can't from Europe to the US can't happen, it's being based on standard practice in Europe. And, and that would really be quite a remarkable finding, I think, by the court. Thank you so much. Laura, would you also like to comment on Peter's presentation and comments maybe? Uh, sure. So um, maybe also on this question of access, I think it's true that there is, there will be some limits on access. It's a national security context, so you can never just give access to, to anybody who asks it. However, I think there is a lot of there is a zone between giving no access at all, which how I currently read the framework, and giving some sort of access. And I, I do think it's a really it's a core part of the fundamental right to personal data protection. It's explicitly mentioned in paragraph two. The court has made this link between access and um, effective judicial remedy. And I think this is a very logical uh, link because how can you even understand if you need to do this effective judicial remedy if you don't know what happened to your data in the first place? And I think Peter in his presentation brought up this very interesting case about the terrorist um, terrorist list and people not having a standing in the US. And I find it that, that rather problematic. I think if, if you are on this list, you should be somehow able to understand that you are on this list because then if you maybe not there for a justified reason, then you should be able to challenge that. And I think this is why access is so so crucial. And it's not it's not easy to do this here. And I also see um, I understand that France, the UK, Germany have similar 
answers and similar limitations. However, I think this is also an area where we have this complicated struggle between the EU not really having competence in national security. However, when it's about transfers, they themselves said in terms too, they do have competence. Um, but of course, if it's a member state and it's national security, they don't. So it is a bit of a, of a complicated balancing act that the Court of Justice always does here. Um, however, we also have the European Court of Human Rights, and I think it does also on the remedy question, it is very strict. And it has also this requirement, um, it calls it notification, and it's maybe not always consistent there because there have been recent cases where it said this notification could be replaced by very easy access to a remedy. Um, so we also will have to see, but there is this idea of notification um, as an important safeguard for effective remedy in a surveillance context. So I hope that there's just a bit more um, reflection of how this can work in a transfer context. And I just, just one sentence. Uh, so another thing that happens in, when there's not access by the individual is the question of whether there's effective oversight by an independent agency to see how the system works. And so the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, as Laura's slide showed, will have oversight responsibilities for the actions of the Data Protection Review Board Accord and of the Privacy and Civil Liberties Officer. So um, when access is not available ex ante, but you have a supervisory independent authority looking at it ex post and at the system, that, that's another kind of safeguard that's been recognized in law. Thank you so much, both of you, for your uh, comments and insights. We have a participant asking a question. It seems uh, that the Biden presidency has helped with getting a revised EU-US data transfer agreement in place. How would another Trump presidency change this, if at all? Can we rely on the Washington machine, or would the focus on e uh, executive orders or the president be a threat to potential future agreements? This is a highly speculative question, but perhaps you could speak more broadly to the role of the US president in enabling EU-US personal data transfers and ultimately the protection of EU individuals' fundamental rights. I, I think that's probably for me first. Laura is welcome to add whatever she wants afterwards. Look, um, let me say a couple of things. One is I disagree with decisions of the US Supreme Court, including on the standing issue. But it's our Supreme Court, and that's a recent authoritative decision of our Supreme Court. So it's the law we have to deal with. Um, second thing is, uh, look, I worked under President Clinton and Obama and not under President Trump. And I have many different kinds of problems with a new President Trump administration. With, with that said, I'll note that the Privacy Shield was negotiated under President Obama and stayed in operation in full force under President Trump and something called PPD 28, the Presidential Policy Directive 28, providing protections for privacy for non-US persons, was issued under President Obama and retained under President Trump. Um, a Trump administration will want there to be commercial relationships between the Europe and the United States. And for the four years that Trump already was president, the agreement stayed in place and weren't really changed. So there's, there's other things that are disasters in my view that we've seen have been disasters. On this issue, perhaps surprisingly, there was less change than for most other issues. Yeah, and also to, to add here, um, I'm not an expert on ex executive orders, um, but I think from a European uh, perspective, the uh, adequacy decision will depend on the executive order. So as soon as it is revoked and also the adequacy decision and I hope the European Commission will do this this time, will actually have to also be uh, revoked or at least uh, suspended until there is some sort of a replacement. So and I think the decision at the current point gives the option to the European Commission to do that. So I think that can be a safeguard um, for the nature of an executive order that could be quite effective if the European Commission is willing to do it. And, and the executive order stays in place until a new president changes it. So Trump doesn't have to issue the executive order again. The executive order from last October remains the law until it's changed under whoever's president. Perfect, thank you so much for your answer. We have another question from a participant. Uh, considering the recent judgments of the Irish DPC against Meta, I was wondering if in your opinion, this judgment leads Meta to opt out from the EU legal market. In other words, con considering that Meta was the defendant in Schrems one and two, I was wondering whether, in your opinion, there is going to be a Schrems three. Uh, I can I can go first here. So I, the Meta decision is uh, very interesting, and I have to be very honest. I have not managed to uh, tackle all its 220 pages <laughs> yet. It's uh, on my to read list still. 
Um, do I think Meta is going to leave the European Union? I, 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 I doubt it because I think the EU remains a very large market, but also I'm, I'm a legal scholar. I'm not an economic expert, so I don't know if they really want to do that or not. I think if they do, it's, it will be interesting, uh, interesting times. I, I'm, I'm not convinced that it would be the end of, of Europe. I, I think we would survive without services um, by Meta. So they're free to do so. Um, however, I really doubt that, that they would. And um, I think even without Meta, there could be a SRAMS free because I mean, the, the data privacy framework is going to be the framework that will be used by a lot of US companies. And you could also then just go to Google and, and ask about Google Analytics, where there have been cases at the data protection authorities. So I think there would be other ways to have um, a new decision on the, the framework, uh, even without Meta. Um, one, one effect of the the Irish decision is that Facebook's under a time deadline of five months or whatever it is. And that puts a, a lot of pressure on the political actors to finish the final adequacy decision um, before the five months happens. So um, uh, Mr. Reinders at, at the CPDP conference last week said that he believed that all the things were in place so that could be concluded this summer. Um, and that there's an urgency if, 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 People go away for August and September, you know, without a decision, then Facebook really would be facing a, a transfer ban and large daily fines. So it, it increases the timing pressure to get an agreement this summer. Thank you so much for your answers. We have another question. Um, does the GDPR set too stringent requirements for international transfers of personal data? So in your opinion, do you think that the GDPR should be revised or amended? I'll, I'll make one point. There's a hundred things we could say about if you change GDPR, how would you change it or not? Um, one, one kind of stringent is what you impose on commercial actors that apply to you know, all the companies. And so you can say you have to have lawful purpose or you can have, you know, the, the issues about government access cannot get fixed by the companies. And I think the US clearly has made a large effort. You might decide it's good enough or not good enough to meet all of the requirements. I don't understand how any trade is possible with China going forward for Europe. Um, they're not a rule of law democracy. Uh, they don't have the, the the structures in place that come anywhere close to, you know, what, what the United States has put in place. India is a huge country with much fewer controls on surveillance, as I've documented in previous writing. And so even if, even if there's a fix on the United States, I literally don't understand what the European legal order is going to do with India and with China. I don't know how trade is lawful with them, given the legal standards really from the court and the charter, not so much from GDPR itself. Uh, yes, to just react to what uh, Peter just said, I, I also agree that I think we kind of too focus on transfers to the United States, which are of course important and commercially uh, very important, but indeed there's also issues with transfers to uh, China, probably to India. I think most of the other adequacy decisions that we do have like Japan, uh, South Korea, not so much, but also the UK, you can ask questions if that is really up to the essential current standard. So um, I think all this reveals that potentially there is a problem with the adequacy system. So I, I think going forward, what would help, um, not so much changing the law, but I think if there would be on a political level, just much more honesty that adequacy decisions are only going to be for countries who are very, very similar to the European Union. And that for all the others, I think it's better to look at the appropriate safeguards, to look at working with the contractual clauses, working with standard contractual clauses, um, maybe specifically per country. I mean, I think there could be a lot of more um, work done there um, and moving away from adequacy. Because indeed, as, as Peter also mentioned, it has in the law a requirement that it needs to be rule of law, there needs to be human rights and fundamental rights. And there's just a lot of countries that based on those three alone, will not ever reach that. So then we have to move to appropriate safeguards. And here it's true that since TRAMS 2, we know that this also has to achieve this high level of protection of fundamental rights. So there are some question mark how this can be done, but I think this is worth um, exploring further and maybe focusing more on than the adequacy system that I agree is, I don't know if it still works that well or if it works for many countries 
I, I think one one concern, though, saying, well, let's just have appropriate safeguards is that um, the, the guidance from the EDPB on appropriate safeguards is so strict that if the data is readable, if it's unencrypted in the third country, then that's not good enough. The safeguards aren't good enough. And you, ha you can't run an employee organization without seeing the name of the employee. You can't do many other commercial transactions without seeing unencrypted data. And so in theory, safeguards could be defined in a way to make it at, uh, lawful to transfer, but at least the way the EDPB has defined the safeguards, that won't work for most business cases. And so the EDPB could change its guidance and, and Theodore Christakis is writing an article on the risk-based approach that could have a, a, a different a, a way to look at how safeguards would operate. Um, but if safeguards have to make it so only encrypted data can be transferred, that's not gonna solve the international business issues for the European Union. Just to add very briefly here, I think, for example, if you take the US, the executive order does um, improve a lot the situation of government access. So I think if you can combine something like the safeguards provided by the executive order with uh, appropriate safeguards, that might be um, a way forward because I, I think a lot of the problems with the EDPB guidance comes again from the governmental access part and putting in place supplementary measures for that. Um, so if you can solve this with something like an executive order for the US, or other sort of additional rules for other countries, then I think that could be something that works, but it would have to be indeed a further research and explored to really understand how. Maybe as a brief follow-up question, because we are running out of time for our webinar today, would you, based on uh, what you just said, qualify the EU-US adequacy decisions as a one-of-a-kind type, given the extensive negotiations and all the issues, or are they similar to adequacy decisions and agreements with other countries, such as you mentioned the UK, for example? Mm, maybe, to, so they're not similar to uh, the UK because that was, a different case because they kind of had the GDPR, so that was a different uh, sort of story. They are in a way similar to Japan and, and Korea, where we also have um, a framework which is based on the decision, and then there's also supplementary rules attached to it. So it's like adequate decision are more and more becoming something where there is a decision, and then there's a lot of other stuff that you also need for this decision to work. In that case, it's, it's similar to um, the US. And um, if you read the Korean and the Japanese uh, decision, then also you see that there are similar issues um, for governmental access, but also for the commercial principles. So it's not um, extremely unique. I think what is unique is all the attention that the US transfer situation has been getting. And, and it's related politically and, and just at a, at a commercial level to the role of US platforms in people's lives. You know, so so people use Facebook and Google and Amazon and Apple and all these companies, and uh, these companies are deeply embedded in the sort of workings, the technical workings of European economy and the U.S. economy, et cetera. And so there's a consequence to rules where actual practices change for Google Analytics or for Facebook services or things that people rely on. And so facts. Facts are different. The legal structure is much more like Korea and Japan, but the facts are quite different. Thank you so much. I think that is a perfect conclusion for our webinars today. For our webinar today, uh, thank you so much for your very interesting perspective. Unfortunately, this is all the time that we have for today. So I would like to thank our speakers for your very interesting discussion as well as our audience members for taking part in this webinar. If you would like to know more about the America Europe Fund, our upcoming events, or watch recordings of past events, including this, uh, the recording of this webinar, you can do so on our website, which is america-europefund.eu. So thank you very much for joining us today, and have a good evening. Thank you.